it's, I'm getting a loady wheel. <laughs> wow, what, how do you do that? I've been wondering how you do that. Look at this. Why? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome everyone to our Wilderness Survival Skills Workshop. I'm Megan from the Nevada County Community Library and I'm here with uh, some educators from the um, Four Elements Earth Education. I wanted to make sure I got that in the correct order. I keep mixing it up in my head, but it's Four Elements Earth Education and they're gonna talk us through um, tips and tricks for uh, surviving, surviving in the outdoors. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, Four Elements Earth Education is the name of our nonprofit, um, but that we, we're known locally as Fox Walkers. It's a lot easier to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and mostly we teach youth um, survival skills. And, but, you know, when you say just youth, it's hard to say just youth because then you're, you're talking about a lot more involvement. Because um, one of the things about youth and I've, I've just been drawn to it, but you know, it's the, the youth are our future and how they're educated is gonna really determine lots. Um, so we're doing our best to get kids outside into nature. Um, and anyway, so, so this, th this program here is based on Station Eleven, the, 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 the fantasy novel. Um, and I have to admit, I didn't read the whole thing. There was another, uh, one of our, one of our interns, he's like a young instructor for us now. He did read it, but he couldn't make it today. And so oh. he did tell us about it though. <laughs> and I've read some stuff about it. And um, what's interesting, 2015, right? This was written. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Was, was it a British author? No, she's Canadian, but she lives oh. in New York now. Oh, she's Canadian. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I know, I know it won some award in, in England or Britain or something. And I was like, oh. So uh, anyways, I know that the, the book is 2015, so it's a few years ago, but it, it is about this uh, pandemic that breaks loose, like, the, like a swine flu type thing, but it, it, it kills a lot of people like really fast, you know, in, in this book. And so it, what I've gathered from this book and what, what, what I kind of like about it is this survival is in, insufficient, like just survival. And I think we're on a similar page with that as far as like, that word survival has become kind of like this, you know, people watch TV and they're like, they think it's like these, these shows they have like alone or what, what are the other shows? Naked and Afraid. Yeah, Naked and Afraid. And I don't know, I, I, there's a lot of shows, but we can get to that later, but um, maybe just a little bit of an intro about myself and about my buddy here, Pashu, uh, before we get going into stuff. Um, and my name is Rick Berry. And yeah, the, the Four Elements Earth Education we, 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 I mean, I started it as a nonprofit and got a lot more people involved about 10 years ago here in Nevada City. Um, but before that, I, I went as a teenager. Um, I used to come visit this area. I'm from the Bay Area, actually, the East Bay. But I used to come up when I was a teenager up to these areas, up to the middle fork of the Yuba. And then I went out to the, the Tracker School, which is in New Jersey when I was 15, which my whole family and everyone's like, you're going to go to New Jersey? <laughs> to like learn survival skills my grandma's like what you know <laughs> so uh yeah anyways went out there and and got introduced and because I, I was really interested in learning like well, these old ways you know and so anyways um d did that and then over the years you know uh, was always interested in getting back to like these kinds of things and and then I saw so I went to high school at her and then I went to college at Humboldt. And while I was at Humboldt State, I, I met a guy that, that lived with an old Yurok Hoopa couple up on the river there and, and hung out with him and, you know, learned, did a lot of hunting and out on the land. And, um, you know, he was kind of a, the old way of he, like Indian doctors, what they call them in California. So he, that's what he did too. And so it was very amazing education. Um, and then I went back to the tracker school and, and, and was a caretaker and lived in like this, uh, this bark house I built for a few years. That was really fun. Um, and then, and then, and then I went on to keep teaching kids. Um, and I really enjoyed it with, with, with sort of like the tracker schools, like youth programs. So we, we had school groups or, you know, we'd have summer camps. Um, and we'd also go to, you know, other, um, you know, 
uh, Native American Indian reservations or First Nations, you know, areas all over Canada and you know, uh, United States. So that was that was pretty pretty fun too. Um, so that's just a little bit of my background, and I, I guess I'll just say that, uh, like, as far as wilderness survival, you know, it's it to me, it's if you're thinking you have to survive the earth, that's one of our problems actually that we have to survive the earth. We've gotten so out of uh, you know, harmony and balance with nature that we feel like we have to survive our own home, basically. Um, and that's kind of what we've done in a way. We, the, the environment has not been, um, you know, stewarded the right way. And, and the, the educational system as well is based on, you know, basically a, a post-industrialized system. Um, it's all based on that, where if you look at an indigenous education, it's it, there's complete differences there, which we can get into later. But um, and I wanted to have I wanted to have Pashu say hello. Go ahead, Pashu. Why don't you say Hi. something about yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Pashu. I work with Rick and I sometimes I forget how long it's been, but I, I'll say it's like been the longest eight years of my life. Um, but no, it's been great. Um, yeah, around 2011, 2012 timeframe, I started working with Rick and 4E. And before that, I was also educated at the <clears throat> at Tom Brown's Tracker School um, and survival and various things like tracking and things like that. Um, for about 10 years now, I've been teaching people, you know, basic survival skills and even more um, more kind of what I, I like as a term or a concept um, being uh, ancient life way uh, skills, you know, where it's, it is like Rick was saying, where it's not necessarily as much of a survival situation because you're uh, a part of that landscape, so to speak. And so that's been a lot of my approach for years and how I've uh, passed on some of these teachings and how, how I've approached my own, uh, <clears throat> my own training and education within a, a pretty uh, wide realm of different survival skills and different um, maybe situations of survival as well. So, um, but yes, that that mentality of uh, of uh, they, some people call it like sur thrival, you know, things like that. There's all kinds of cool buzzwords, but yeah, essentially uh, working with what you've got instead of working against what you've got is just seems common sense, like a good idea. And uh, so I kind of tried to base that simplicity um, on a lot of my, or base my training on that simplicity. Um, but yeah, God, it's been uh, a lot of years. I was uh, very young as a child when I uh, first started getting interested in, in ancient cultures and indigenous life way and things like that. So I studied that a lot um, in my youth and, that's actually been ultimately one of these things that's really um, stimulated me and gassed me in my career with Rick is that, uh, you know, when I was learning this stuff or some of these things um, as a child, I didn't have a program or anything like that. There weren't, you know, wilderness programs for kids at that time. So uh, it's, uh, it's something that kind of fuels my, uh, my fire with this program to to kind of be able to help and provide and hold a space uh, for young people to kind of learn this stuff. Because as, as I've observed anyway, it's the, the, the younger you are when you start really embracing a lot of these, um, these kind of subtler notes of nature. I mean, like the art of, of tracking, you know, um, and being able to identify and follow tracks, things like that. I mean, in, in ancient cultures, children would start learning this from a very, very, very young age. I mean, as soon as they could walk, they were learning the tracks. They were learning how to read the story of their landscape and their home as it unfolded on a day-to-day -day level. And um, and that's kind of what it takes. And so, I mean, we're both really passionate. The program is really passionate about um, providing that opportunity again for young people to come back to that stuff. And, and you know, I've, and, I've seen plenty of adults really embrace this stuff too and really just jump in, you know, like literally jumping in the mud sometimes because um, that happens with our programs, but, and, uh, and really immerse. And so I also think all that being said that you're never too old to really start getting in touch with the earth and in touch with how your feet contact the earth, 
literally and metaphorically. Um, so yeah, that's who I am. Thanks, Bosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, we just wanted to give a little, cause you know, so much of what we do too, like we were talking about uh, relationships. Um, it could be like a kid will come and this is about how we approach like this survival mentality, survival mind, or as a caretaker, you know, a kid will come into camp and it'll be like, he'll grab a stick off the ground. He'll say, that's mine. And we'll be like, well, how come all of a sudden it's yours? It's just was sitting there and uh, probably some other kid carved it at Fox Walkers anyway, but you know, they just think, and then, then the, the new kid may or may not go and start hitting like a tree or a branch or a bush and I'll be like hey what are you doing you're like hitting my that's my brother the tree and they're like and they they like that's my relation you know and so it's like all of a sudden they're kind of like oh sorry you know <laughs> and, they, and they you know and, and, and I'm not like telling them not to do it but it's like hey you're hitting my relative my brother or sister they're like yeah, how do you think you know <laughs> so and so there's a couple things there of like why all of a sudden is it yours ownership and then also th this is this is this is from my view this is my family out here so there's this relations things where you have a relation with someone else a person but you have a relationship with a tree or with the water or you know all these things and you know one thing i learned it was funny when i was in college i didn't learn it per se at college but my, some of my professors were um native folks and and my friend a good friend of mine who wasn't actually native, but he lived with the natives for so long. Um, it's this concept of you have something called a natural resource, which, you know, a lot of people call it that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, but I was really taught like, hey, you know, maybe think about that. How is it that you're gonna just call it a natural resource instead of a relationship you have? Like the salmon is a natural resource that we use. It's a resource. Yeah, it's a resource, but you dig a little deeper it's a relationship and if you see it like that you start to think oh how do i get to know that one you know on an intimate way because if you if you catch a salmon let's say it's like there it is it's in your hand like whoa that's a powerful being right there it's not just a resource so it's this way of thinking um and so i was getting at that because it's always good to, to like know who people are build relations and then also st start to build relations with everything else in a way because to me that's a very very old way um because what can happen in schools and when you're teaching kids is it can be this resource but it's like it's over here it's a resource it's like over there and it can start to feel like hey this is something that can be bought and sold and traded and and we can make money off of it and then all of a sudden it starts to shift and pull away from this intimate relationship with something um that that, that becomes like this um, you know, this commodity bought and sold. And so it's, it, it, it starts to lose um, connection. And I think that's what happens in our society. So that's just one example of um, when, when we talk about language, we talk about um, uh, resources, even that word. And so survival too is something, and I was, we, I was talking about that a sec ago about you know that it's it's this image of maybe someone in a bunker or something i don't know like a prepper or something and we're definitely not like preppers however always good to be prepared you should be prepared um and the way both posh and i were taught of the tracker school to be prepared is knowing the most you can know about any situation so you know about how to do things that maybe you don't want to hear about maybe there's like a martial arts technique or there's um you know, how to use a gun, how to pick locks, how to do all, like everything, right? You wanna know as much as you can about everything. Situation comes up, you know how to deal with it or you, you've you thought about it to where you're not gonna panic, you know? Because, <laughs> ah, no. you know, so, 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 and have a plan. It's always good to have a plan. So I wanted to talk about real quick, like if you have like wilderness survival, okay, you have wilderness survival and you have city and suburban survival. I mean, so they're, there's some different things there, but however, there's four basic elements and that's our four elements of our, when we call it four elements earth education. Um, there's the four elements of like survival and one is shelter, okay? One is water, 
one is fire and one is food. So there's those four things and everybody needs those things to live. I mean, there's the four elements like, you know, what is it? The air, water, fire, earth, earth. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of similar, but this is a little different because you're talking about things that actually you're there and you actually like air. Well, hopefully you have that. If you don't, I don't know. That's you're on another planet, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, um, so, but, you know, you, you, you add in these things. So shelter, let's say you have so much, you only have so many hours, either it's too hot or too cold that you're going to survive. And that's actually the quickest one. I don't know, Pachi, what is it like, you know, a matter of hours, right? With the cold weather, especially, yeah. right? That you can survive, right? So. Yeah, heat, heat stroke and hypothermia can, can set in in a couple of hours, you know, and hypothermia can be very sneaky. You know, it can come in even in conditions people don't expect. So shelter by far, shelter is number one, which that can also just be your clothing as well. That could be your clothing you chose to wear in that situation or your foresight of maybe what could happen if you go hiking in December, you know, common sense. Yeah, so like 55 degrees and raining, is hypothermic conditions actually, which happens in the winter in California and the summer in Alaska. <laughs> it's actually pretty dangerous in, in the summer in Alaska because it's wet. I mean, the colder weather is cold, but it's not wet and people think it's summer, you know, too. And so um, I know, cause we, we go up to Alaska in the summer. It's really nice, but it does get wet. It's like California winter. Um, so yeah, like Pasha was saying, the, the, the clothing on you is like that shelter. And so there's, um, hey, there's a picture. You want to bring that close to Pasha? Let's see. There's a, there's a picture of a debris hut, we call it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, like right there. So you can see these are some of our students from a while back. Actually, this is, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Um, but they make these, they're basically like stick frames with debris on top. And this girl right here, this was a night that it was 22 degrees out right here in Nevada City at our spot at the the, the, the Burton, um, 22 degrees. And she um, had to get out because she was she got a little too hot, actually. Yeah. In her hut. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she made it really good. I don't know. I, I think I don't think she made that up. But anyway, she was really, she was warm enough. And I think she did she have a blanket or you probably weren't there. Were I wasn't there. You weren't there. Uh, she might have had a blanket. I don't remember. It might have been sometimes a blanket can be too much. But we teach this. So it's like without a blanket, without a fire, because that's the worst case scenario. Right. And if she doesn't. I don't know why this picture, I don't think they were done yet, but there's a door that goes on here, actually. I don't, I don't think they were done because they don't, but you can see how high this debris is, right? It goes to your arm, your arm length of debris. So it's like, you know, this R40 resistance value, just, just like a straw bale home or something. So, um, and the brilliancy of this filter too, like I said, you don't, it's whatever it is you have. So if you have, um, you know, if you're in a city or whatever situation, it's whatever debris is around you. So it doesn't have to be leaves and stuff that looks nice, but it, 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 it could be, if you're in the city, it could be cardboard, go, go to the recycling bin and get a bunch of cardboard, you know, it's whatever it takes to keep your, um, so you can heat a space up with your own body heat and it retains it through dead air space, basically. It's a principle. So a lot of these things have um, this certain principle and they, you take it and like over the years myself, when I was a little bit younger, I would go and I would try it out in the Southwest. I tried it in Alaska, you know, tried it in, in, in Florida, tried it up in the, like all went all over. Now I didn't go down to South America, but you know, North America all over and try and it, it stuff works. It's like, yeah, that, that worked, that worked. And, you know, it could be, I mean, I haven't done it too much in the city. Have you done the city thing? Or not what? The city debris hut? I, I, did, <laughs> I did spend two weeks in a, uh, a shelter that I made out of uh, many layers of cardboard, you know, because I mean, every transient person in the world knows the insulative value of cardboard. I mean, that it's it's got these, it's got multiple layers, but it's got this, air in between. Mm -hmm. And so when you stack a bunch of layers of that, you're getting R value, you're getting dead air space, you're getting insulative qualities. 
And, you know, I've, I've also played with, uh, I mean, you know, if, if any of you have kids, um, they love to build forts out of couch cushions and stuff like that. Um, you can, in fact, like just take a couple of couches and some mattresses and make um, a very insulated little cave, you know, and, and what's the practical application of that? I mean, aside from kids having fun, well, a lot of people live on the grid and maybe in wintertime, if a power outage happened, then a lot of heaters would be going out. Not everybody lives in the country with like, wood. I have a wood stove, you know, I don't have to worry about the heat in my house, but. Um, we did have a question on Facebook. Yeah. Um, what kind of workshops do you do where you teach and make this overnight shelter and what ages are those programs for? Hmm. Right. Um, well, most of, like I said, we do youth. Um, and I think that one in particular, usually we, we do with our Fox Walker kids locally. Um, and then with the kids ones though, and I'll, I'll talk about the adult one in a sec, is we have um, usually in the late fall, right, is the best time to do it. Because actually in the summer, it's like not as, you don't really need it that as bad unless you're higher elevation. Um, so we, we so in the summer, we go up higher in elevation, like what, a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah. It was just a couple weeks ago, we had the wilderness youth passage, like a wilderness passage for youth. And we went out and it was 32 degrees out and um, they, they made a shelter and slept in it and some of them didn't sleep the whole very well because <laughs> that that's their challenge um so so we did that up the, in the high country um they did have a blanket um so we do that at that level and then at, at the fox walker level when they're even younger they could try and we usually do that in december um around here so it could maybe be raining and stuff and then as far as adults i don't know posh you, you help lead those when we do those like once a year yeah and it, yeah, it, yeah. it's Once a, a year, usually a um, weekend thing um and i think i think we did it last september so what ages are the fox walkers what was that what ages are the uh, the younger ones so so the fox walkers are generally like 7 to 12 and then we have a teenage 13 to 17 so there's oh. two versions there. and then there's a young fox walkers which is 4 to 6 oh. um and the and with that the young fox walkers um it's so great. It's different for them because they're kind of exploring and you're just kind of like with them in nature and you're not like, okay, here you're going to learn how to do a boat roll, but you know, they, they can maybe see fire and be around things, but it's great. The, the parents just being outside is so good. So yeah, but basically it's seven, you know, we start to get them like, you know, d doing different skills, like making this hut, um, carving. Um, so did that answer the question from Facebook? I don't know how that works. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as far as shelter goes, though, I have, I just want to say that it, it, when I was at the tracker school and I wanted to say about, about Tom's thing, like I've learned from a lot of different people, but like the skills he's, he's got experience, like very few people. He went out for 16 months and like, you know, in like basically naked, like he did seriously went out and stayed for, he loved it and he gained 20 pounds, you know? So, but he, this is where he lived and he did this. And the other thing he was by himself for most of that time, which I spent like about a month or so by myself one time I was like, oh my God, this is pretty tough because <laughs> it takes a special kind of person. But anyways, um, <clears throat> and he always told me like, he really helped me become up with a foundation for some of these skills and how to teach kids. And cause he was a kid when he was taught and he always said, Hey, shelter is really important. If nothing else, teach shelter because shelter gives you that home. It, it calms any kind of nerves. It's like you have a place you can get warm. And that said though, like fire is very important too, because fire now might be harder to get. If you don't have any tools, if you don't have a knife, matches, lighter, all that, like good luck, especially if you don't have intense training on how to make a, a friction fire. If you don't, then you better know how to make the shelter if you really need it. So the, 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 the fire making thing, it, the thing is, if, if you, even if you have a, a match or a lighter, that's great. If you know how to set up the TP fire structure, because when you can light a fire, your morale goes way up because it's like, there's your buddy, right? There's the fire. Oh yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it, as far as, but <clears throat> you also have this thing of, um, I don't know. Did you want to say something about fire? Is, is or shelter related to that posture? Uh, as shelter relates to fire? Well, I don't know. <laughs> or, or water too, you know, how that mixes in. Are we gonna, 
Are we going to do water after this? Yeah, or we can do water now because really it is, you have shelter, water, fire, food. But why I talk about fire so much, because for, for me, working with youth, a lot of times if I'm teaching the skill, not in the actually out, you know, doing it like that, but teaching it, that is something that gets their attention a lot rather than let's build a shelter. Sometimes they're into that, but they're more into like, well, there's a fire. How'd you do that? You know, <laughs> so I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the teaching um, uh, thing of, of getting kids a, attention and, and, and sort of like the survival of interest of your students. Because nowadays there's so much out there, you know, they might be more excited to learn about that than, oh, how you find a spring, you know, well, that's, that's kind of exciting, but not, not as exciting as fire maybe. So, anyway, but the importance of it too, well, go, go ahead, Pasha, you want to talk to me about those relationships? Yeah, too? well, I mean, especially like, like fire and shelter, how they come together, it's kind of, um, <clears throat> fire and shelter, their relevance, I think, has a lot to do with um, with uh, the kind of like the emotional internal side of shelter and what that means and what that does for us. Um, and to speak from, you know, n nowhere near like the level of experience like Tom Brown has, like going out for 16 months, but to speak from my own survival experience, um, it feels really good to just have a place to go home to and to go back to. And to have a lot of faith and comfort in that home as being something that can keep you warm and comfortable and give you a good night's sleep. And I, um, this was last month, yeah, but we took um, a group of eight teenagers out for 10 days of, of uh, full survival. You know, I mean, they went out with a knife and a blanket and a water bottle and a little bag of snack rations that any of them, I mean, some, some of you might have teenagers, you know, teenagers will eat the amount that we gave them for 10 days in four hours usually so i mean it was it was a kind of an endurance trial for them but they uh they hung tough and the first day or two they didn't get a shelter built but they were able to get fire off of the landscape and make friction fire kits and a bow drill fire and we they made some simple shelters the first couple of nights but they they were lacking um a good water source, but they were also lacking a place to call home. And it's funny because within four days, once they had found those things, I kind of called them all out to recognize like, hey, how does it feel to walk into back into camp now? Like instead of just being aimless, wandering around, trying to find these things we need, now you at least have a home. And fire really tends to the, the, like Rick was saying, it just can lift you up and kind of brighten your mood a bit. I think tending to that, that emotional side of what shelter and what these, these four survival elements actually are is also really important to tend to, you know, because aside from just the fear of like, what if I freeze to death or what if I die of thirst or what if I can't ever cook my food or what if I starve to death? I mean, these are, these are kind of irrational fears in a certain in a certain regard. They're easily dealt with by education, you know, um, and just learn learning stuff. You know, um, fear of starving to death should not be a fear, um, but unfortunately now it is because we've gotten really disconnected mm -hmm. with our food sources, you know, um, in a variety of ways. But anyway, do you want to? Should we talk about water? Yeah. Um, well, I did. I just wanted to make a comment too. I, I went up to go visit these guys on this this like you know survival kind of quest trip they were on, and um, it was amazing how how well they were doing. Though I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? They found water. You know, they they were able to like you know um, trap some rodents and stuff. I was like, what? You know, like, um, and and they found a fishing pole and caught fish or something. You know, I was like, what? <laughs> it was, you know, um, and and also there's plants that um, out there, and because what once you have those things and with, well, you know, um, the food is a lot of the work. And I there's like this kind of this wheel I was telling Pasha about this like this. There's this, there's this thing of amount of work. And once you have the shelter, you have the water, you have the fire, all the re most of the rest of the work is food because you're getting, that's sustaining you, right? And so they have these, uh, they, they, we call them yampa around here. I mean, you could call them like potatoes basically, but they're, they're a lot smaller than potatoes, but they're like potatoes. 
they're like a wild potato. Um, <clears throat> and I know I just found out from my brother, by the way, um, that the biggest ones are in Oregon, actually. Yeah, 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 the, yeah where he lives some of the some of the year. So, <laughs> but they're you know they're little tubers. Um, but anyway, this was this trip. But to get back to water, yeah, I think like for myself personally, water, you know, um, it's something that you know it's like I've always kind of tried to find the pure source of water actually. And so usually when I've gone out to places and, and sort of played survival, you know, like practice skills, I like to go to places in the mountains or something away from people and all that. And usually there's springs and I've always been able to find springs actually. And there's a, there's a, there's a knack to that too, where you look for certain vegetation and plants in the landscape. For instance, if you're up here in the mountains, if you see like willow, somewhere you, you, willow needs year round water or twinberry or like azaleas or, you know, all sycamores, like you'll see a like, hey, that's that's water right there. And so it's always fun. And then there is some different over the years. That's what I've always enjoyed. Um, I know Posh, you had some experience, too, with um, with fire and water, too. Right. What, what, why don't you talk about that? Because finding pure water. I think is really important if, if you know how to do that and, and you can be what, what's that say that's another thing with relationships so you're building a relationship with water and there's this whole thing of of the two different types of like survivalists maybe if you want to call it that is 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 one goes in and puts their will against the land kind of thing and i'm i need you know and it's like but in the other person might be more um, letting go of their will and letting the land guide them. And then you, you can find that water source or what you need. It's like your body knows where it is and then you can allow that. Don't let your mind totally or, or, or dominate too much. But this and then you, you'll like wander. This is my experience. And then it's like, oh, here's the water. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, and then also, yeah, why don't you talk about, yeah, your experience with some of the water things you've done, Pasha? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're, there's always, um, <clears throat> there's always something to learn. And I, that's why I kind of love this game we're in, because I, all I got to do to really challenge myself or go learn something new is just go out in the woods with maybe something that I without something that I need or something and it it would it there's there's something to the vulnerability of it okay and it's uh it's counterintuitive to the way a lot of a lot of our world runs now but there is really something to just going out in the nature and being vulnerable in that way because of how it makes us think how it makes us act react how it brings out some of a lot of our buried instincts and brings out much of our uh, underused back self, back shelved sensory ability, you know, all, all of these things. Um, but one thing I would like to say about water that's kind of a, it's, it's the interesting ironic tragedy of it all. And it's the water to me, water uh, to me is very synonymous with a legacy, okay? And for, for thousands and thousands of years, the legacy that people that lived close to the earth all over the world, I mean, not even specific to any continent, um, left a legacy for their future generations of, you know, good water and, you know, um, biodiverse ecosystems that were healthy and well managed with, you know, very old natural stewardship methods. Um, and right on down to those uh, those yampa potatoes I was eating with these teenagers on, on this trek, um, those were there because of thousands of years of wild tending that the old people that lived in the foothills here in our in our you know Nevada County area would go up in the summer and tend those yampa fields, and so we were eating a five thousand year old legacy that these people left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's a very rare thing to get to experience now. So I cherish those opportunities deeply. But whereas the ancient people, they had the legacy left behind of the wisdom of their elders and the cleanliness and, um, and, and healthiness of the conditions of the habitats they left behind, um, we were given kind of our generation, our time as modern people, um, we don't have some of those luxuries some of our legacy has a little bit of a different tone to it 
And part of that legacy is the fact that a lot of our water is very sick right now. You know, and the amount of fresh water, the ability to just go drink fresh water um, is becoming hindered and, and shrinking all the time. Um, I've gotten to drink out of a lot of springs um, and I got to drink out of uh, some rivers in Alaska that were glacier melt. But, uh, but I've also gotten Giardia and I've gotten messed up by water before. Um, and I think the important thing is to, I, I, for me is I don't blame the water. It's not the water but it's part of this legacy that's been tied in with it. And so as far as um, an actual necessity of keeping healthy and safe with water, I'm, I'm pretty big on recommending people use this current legacy that we're living in, that our, our recent ancestors kind of left for us. The waters are kind of polluted, but they also left us technology to make water filters and things like that. And they are valuable and it's a modern thing. It's a modern thing that treats a modern condition and a modern circumstance. And um, mm -hmm. it is a good thing to have, but you can also rely very soundly on a lot of these ancient skills because um, if you can track water, if you can track a landscape with that awareness, you can, you know, you can find fresh water or you can get very creative and figure out how to get yourself enough water out there. It's, it, it, it is not a, that big of a challenge to give yourself a drink of water. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe you got to, uh, maybe you got to like use your metal canteen or something and boil some creek water, you know, but that's all dependent on your fire starting abilities. And so that's the time, every, all these, skills kind of tie into each other. So I wouldn't say that there's one to practice more than any other because there's a lot of relevance to staying healthy. <clears throat> and you know, a fun, one other thing about water, a fun demonstration thing. And I've, maybe you've done it in the field before. I mean, I, I like I said, I've usually like to find pure water, but you, you, you know, you can get, you have to make a fire first and you burn like a bowl or a, container out of something and i've done it in bark so you might not need a fire for that but then you need a fire to heat rocks and you take those rocks and you put it into the vessel and you boil it that way you know that and, but it, i've never actually had to do that per se but i i have i've done it uh, as a teaching way of like learning how to do it um i've done it with like bird spark and i've done it with like you know wooden burning a bowl and having a container and then you <clears throat> heat rocks up boil the water that kind of, kind of thing and it's kind of fun it's a, it's a fun process for actually kids to see it's like oh how do you how are you gonna do that oh yeah so it's just it's it, i always like because it's a different way of thinking um so we have uh the the shelter and we've talked about the water and so the fire thing we, we've talked a little bit about i just want to say that you know there, there is of course that's another thing with relations and so many people are scared of fire because of what's happened in california and different places Hence, because our environment is out of balance, once again. Um, but then people are so afraid of it. It's like, oh, my God. And some parents are like, you're teaching my kid how to make fire. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And But I'm like, you know, the, the friction way is very difficult. So, wow. I mean, I've never had a problem with them starting forest fires with because they're, they're out of control. Fr friction fire, like a bow drill or a hand drill. Um, and I don't have one here. We're, we're like in the office on Zoom. But um, you can look them up, um, but they're a way to make fire by friction. There's like the hand drill like this or a bow drill. And there's many other ways, but those are some of our main ways that we teach. And let me just tell you, it's, it's, there's a lot of learning that goes involved. You got to carve this. Have you ever tried it before? You're shaking your head. Have you, have you ever tried it? Yeah, I was a, I was a Girl Scout for a few years um, and we, uh, we got to practice some stuff. It's really, it takes so much effort. So in your Girl hard. Scout, really? In your Girl Scouts, you guys tried friction fire? Yeah, I, I did a camp every year and yeah. It's... Oh, that's so cool. Well, you had a good leader because sometimes you, you don't know, it depends on your leader, you know, who. Well, oh, actually it was my sister. <laughs> your sister? Whoa. Yeah, she was a counselor and she was into it. So she that's went. So, oh, that's yeah. good to hear. Yeah, because you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's like a lot of work. It's like, whoa. And once you do it, you're like, oh my God, it's like a passage onto itself, like a right to passage. It's like, yeah, you were in that bed. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, anyway, so the, the fire making, there's that, but there's also just, can, can you, we do like five minute fires, 
even with one match, like that's a fun, especially when it's raining out, you know? So there's different ways to get your skills up um, as far as fire. Any, what, what do you want to say about fire, Pasha, as far as? Uh, I mean, anything? like, like, I mean, this is, should sound like a broken record at some point. It's a relationship, you know, it's building a relationship and <clears throat> especially like learning a lot of these old ways. Um, they weren't invented and they weren't used under circumstances that that we impose with our modern minds. They were they were developed over a very long time from observation. Okay. And 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 so part of that, some of that has to do with a lot of how we're we're educated through the tracker school and how we teach at our programs is is has to do with the art of questioning. Okay. And so it, it's a more um, ancient way of learning. It's a way of learning through observation by watching things happen. Um, and uh, I, I think it might be one of the stark differences between now and then is we're a very answer-based society now. And back then they were a very question-based society and there was a lot more mystery. Um, and uh, who's to say what's better? I just, that's an observation of differences, I guess. But so remembering that with all of these, these really ancient skills is they came out of a time when all of our ancestors were like surviving an ice age. And the reason that these skills survived to actually get passed on is because they worked and they worked quite well. But the, um, the, the approach is important. You know, and I think the uh, the attitude to approaching um, survival, uh, the dirty word, the, the elephant in the room, <laughs> survival, um, it, it is about pursuing it as a connection, as a relationship building with, with creation, with nature, with the materials you're using. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's the most important part, really, because otherwise <clears throat> there's like the idea of the survivalist and this like kind of apocalyptic prepper bug out kind of situation and a lot you know in a lot of ways you can view that as like someone who's almost like a, a scourge on the landscape or like a, a threat to the landscape because they're consuming so many resources you know and that's that's uh i think one of the things that sets apart a lot of what we do from kind of that more modern survival kind of fear-based survival mentality um, is the fact that we're we're pursuing not only that attitude of building relationships, but also that attitude of caretaking and stewardship with the landscape, um, because we absolutely do believe that the landscape is what sustains us. And when you're out living on it that close with it and that vulnerable to it, um, you can't doubt it for a minute. You know, and I mean, there's there's times where I've been out in the woods and either gotten a little cocky or a little bit of something. And I got, I got spanked a little bit, you know, like it happens sometimes, you know, you're feeling, it happened to the teenagers I was just out with. They were feeling all good. They were getting all this food. They were feeling all cool. And they really didn't build that great of shelters. <laughs> and oh, then this gnarly the thunderstorm hailstorm, came in, hail hailing, along. hail the size of marbles, slamming for hours. And you never saw a group of teenagers hustle so fast to get more debris and more insulative coating on their structures that they had built. And I just, I, you know what I did? I went and took a nap in my hut because it was super thick and nice and well insulated. And I just took a nap and hung out and enjoyed the sound of the hail. It was amazing. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, she'll spank you sometimes if you're not paying attention. But that's that's part of this way of approaching it. It's like, okay, we just, we try and observe. We ask questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I wanted to also, because I know you were talking, Megan, about like there's this book and there's this pandemic thing. And then there's now there is a pandemic. The book came out a while ago. So, you know, and it's not like the book. It's not it's not fantasy. It's it's reality. And, you know, there's there's and I think what we've been saying a lot is relations and your attitude. And that is so important. Right. It's the it's the stuff that's in here. I mean, there's all this stuff out here, but if you're not ready in here, then how are you going to do any of it anyway, right? You got to be able to think straight, act right. And also, I think just respecting, you know, the nature and also each other. That's so much, I, you know, 
it really draws out of people what you know different things and so i wanted to say about like this pandemic thing um is being prepared is good because then you're not going to be like uh, caught off guard and then do something that's not very uh, it's like a panic like the flight you know or fight kind of thing you know it's like you're going to be based in you know calm you know uh, reaction you're not just reacting you're calmly being able to okay, assess the scene and be like go, go from there and so i think just that in itself is is important to, to that, that we know what what could happen and you know for myself for 35 years i've been hearing like you know that the, when i went to tom brown school of like hey this could happen and I was like, oh, really? How really? Is that really gonna happen? I hope Tom Brown is wrong, <laughs> but but he hasn't been yet. And you know, if you look at like a uh, even just the biological curve, like this bell curve, you ever seen one of those things where it's like this, and there's a population, and the population goes like this, and it's in all these biological curves for wildlife, let's say. All right, and then but then I'm looking at it going, well, how how are we out of that? Are we just not a part of that? Hmm, I don't know. So it's a caring capacity too. And so you, you got to look at, there's a science part of it that's actually, you know, I've, I've met some pretty hardcore scientists that are like, well, it's not. If this collapse or whatever's going to happen, it's like when, you know? So, and the thing is, it's how we're going to go through that, you know, how we're going to integrate and, and, and transform through that. And I know, I know for myself, education is is key i'm an educator though so it's like well that's where i'm looking at it and i think right now especially for us in our school and what we're doing is even just being outside is so important and it's a little safer right now so um and that connection so i think that's building and i really think we really have to reassess you know our society has to reassess well how are we educating our children because this system that we've built for so many years, we're just used to it. We're used to the convenience of it. We're used to it, this productivity. Um, and it's it's a hard one. And it, and I've always said to myself, it's gonna take something to get folks to change. Because it's, it's nice to have all these conveniences and all this stuff. But then you look at the stress levels, you look at the levels of, uh, you know, just the way we're starting to live. It's like pretty soon people are gonna be like, wait a second, maybe we have to look at different ways. And, you know, I know Tom over the years, you know, he's talked about that, like, what about there's certain things in life? Like, what about, you know, what, what, what are things you're passionate about? What are things that bring you joy, bring you love, bring you peace, bring you harmony, like, and a purpose beyond yourself? Like, he's always said that I, I love all those things because it's like, if we can start to educate that way. Um, but anyway, I know, Pasha, did you want to say something about being ready for like a pandemic in this modern time or, you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I said, when I started off, I mean, I've, I've, I've let my my survival interest carry me all over the place, right? Even to dirty word survival, like nasty survival, you know, I mean, because in a lot of ways, that's. I. I got, I got to admit to the fact that, um, you know, some of this stuff that either it's in media, it's fiction or nonfiction, some of this stuff you hear about or some of these images that get conjured are, are freaking scary. And so, um, especially um, inspired by Tom Brown and Stocking Wolf and the way they did things, um, for a lot of years now, my, my approach to my own fear has been to try and educate to to the extreme degree that I can. Um, the cure for fear being knowledge and one idea, but not just learning stuff, but, but training stuff, doing stuff, experiencing things in a very physical, visceral level. Okay, now there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, and I, I, I dabble in all kinds of things because my interests go all over the place, but really I think, I think it's valuable in these, these times um, to give realistic assessments of, um, of of threats to healthy living. Just to be, you know, to 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 be a little um, more broad spectrum with that, because survival, like many of us, are so far away from a survival situation, and 
you know, so I really just want to, I'll address comfortable living because during the quarantine, a lot of people were not living comfortably. And, and I know this, I, I talked to folks that were really not stoked on that situation. And, and why was that? Well, so assessing those threats, assessing risks to the S word survival, right? Um, so for me, um, one of the things that made me really nervous um, was uh, the, the, the threat of people, right? And the, all the things that can go along with, um, with people. I mean, there, there's a sketchy person walking around out there right now. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, she, she was a lovely woman. Yeah, anyway. No. Um, so assessing threat. What, is the, what are those threats? Maybe they're people, are they, you know, are they people with guns? Are they people with bad intentions? Is it accidents? Is it um, like disasters where there's all of a sudden a lot of wounded people? Like maybe it doesn't, maybe you, you bringing survival skill set or a mentality or that, um, that attitude or preparation with your skills could serve in so many ways. I mean, even if that's treating um, massive bleeding in a wound that someone, some perfect stranger has received, you know? So um, by far, and that's it, my personal opinion, but I think a lot of us kind of share it from the Tracker family anyway, is that um, we don't have to really be too afraid of nature, okay? I mean, I, and nobody here, I, I mean, you. You can get my personal information if you really want to have an argument about it, but none of you have ever had your back, had, had nature turn their back on you because you're alive right now. And it maybe spanked you a few times, gave you some lessons, but, but nature has never turned her back on me. And I have no reason to fear the natural world. Well, I'm sure I could come up with some, you know, huge bears are kind of scary, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's not a lot of reason to fear nature. A lot of the most dangerous things in this world come from the world of man. And so um, if any of those things are pressing um, concerns, because I know they have been for a lot of people. I know I have a whole lot of friends that just recently got lots of dried grains in their house and I, have I thought lots, you were going to say chickens. I have lots of friends. <laughs> I have lots of friends that just got chickens. I have lots of friends that just uh, came home with their first gun. You know, um, people are thinking about this stuff, and I think more importantly than going out and impulse buying a bunch of things is to calm your mind by educating yourself and and learning. And you know, there's a lot of perspectives on everything. So it's not just about learning one perspective. There's, there's a whole lot to learn. So, you know, as far as preparations for this situation, I think part of that preparation is, is a assessment of not only what are your goals, okay? What are your goals within all of this? Where are you gonna end up? Where do you wanna be? And then, you know, what are you willing to live without? What's, your, what's an actual comfort threshold, you know? And then how are you gonna maintain that? Because really like living, living in just intense survival, like being shot at with like bloody wounds and like, <laughs> you, like your buddy's got gangrene. Like that's not like that, nobody's surviving for a long period of time that way. So let's forget that one. But yeah, you know, not realistic. What kind, of, what kind of things are really advantageous? Knowing how to get food, knowing um, and being aware of vectors that could pollute or make water unsafe to drink, um, basic awareness and tracking, shelter building, there's all these great skills, but they all come together, not at all, or they are all worth nothing without your attitude, without, I mean, some positivity and some hope for one. And then also, um, you know, th this attitude of, you know, deal with fear by learning. You know, deal with, okay, I mean, you're, you're feeling stressed out, go bang out some squats and push-ups, and then go look up a YouTube video on how to make a fire with a battery and a gum wrapper, and you might feel better, you know, something, there's, there's some cool stuff. And yeah, there's, there's, as a librarian, I'd say the best takeaway from, I think, this, this workshop is that, you know, the best survival skill is information. <laughs> it's, 
accurate yeah. information. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and I would add to that practicing it, you know, getting your hands and your body in on it. But oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's all I have to rant about that stuff really. But yeah, <laughs> like medical training, martial arts, all that stuff. It's great. I'm gonna say, did, did you guys have other questions or, or was there anyone? I just, I didn't know what. Uh, we haven't had any other questions on on Facebook that I see, um, but yeah, this has been this has been great. I love that 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 ending part is <laughs> the best. I think the attitude and, and information that's that's the best takeaway for me as a librarian coming from a library perspective is like, hey, we've got that, we've got information, and if you're you know wanting accurate stuff, we know who to send you to as well. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, uh, like I said, we're, we're still open right now, at least, um, <laughs> small groups and stuff. And we'll probably put together some adult things too. And the online thing has been pretty remarkable for us too. Actually, we have, it, amazingly enough, we have kids from like all over the world, actually, that we, we're able to connect with now on the internet. And it's, it's not our favorite medium. His passion, he just loves the internet. No, just, but you know, you, you can make a difference. You can, we can reach kids and teenagers, especially from all around the world. And it's been kind of amazing um, that we, we can, we can do that and, you know, uh, inspire them to go outside and, and, and do more things. So um, yeah, anything else from you, uh, Megan, do you want to uh, say before we wrap up here? Or? Well, no, um, that, that was fantastic. That was such a great, inspiring <laughs> workshop from you guys. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, and I'm just gonna remember those four four elements, right? Yeah, those are the important ones. Well, thank yeah, you what the kids much. say is, uh, what is it? Shelter, water, fire, food, that's the sacred order, dude. Kind of like <laughs> <a> mantra, <you> <laughs> <know>. <laughs> that was the kids in Philly, Jamie, that came, well, outside of Philly, uh, East Coast, yeah. So. That's great. Cool. All right, well, thank you guys. I'm gonna take us off of live now.